I want to begin this service with the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 1, beginning with verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which translated means God with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are here to worship you. And we are here to worship your Son. And we are here to worship by the strength and the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. And so, Holy Trinity, we bow before you this evening. And we gladly bring our treasures, our hearts, our mind, our soul, our strength, all that is within us we bring and we lay it before your throne and we worship you. We praise you for so great a salvation. We praise you for so great a Savior. And we rejoice and celebrate the birth of our King. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for so great a love that would send forth His only begotten Son, to rescue us from the depths of our depravity, to rescue us from the depths of our sin, to engage humanity through the incarnation and the wonder and the splendor of it all. We adore you this day. We adore you each and every day. But in this moment of time, I pray that your spirit would move in our midst so that as we rise up, we sing from the depths of our being. We sing songs of praise and of adoration and of joy and of peace. All because of the precious, precious birth and life and victorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, I pray, this day to worship you in a manner worthy of your holy name. And this we pray in the sacred, most precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. 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 We invite you to rise as we sing songs of praise to our Lord.
For unto us a child is born. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Broken by a baby's cry. 
exalted now, the King of kings. Praise God for the hallowed danger ground. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God incarnate, here to dwell, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, praise His name,
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as your word would tell us, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to you alone be glory. To you alone be praise. So we look into your word here this evening, I pray, open our eyes to behold wondrous truths from your precious and sacred word. Move in our hearts here today, soften them, and break them down, I pray, so that we're in the best place to receive eternal truth here this day. May it then propel us through the weekend and through the weeks ahead as we're reminded once again of the wonder of the incarnation, the precious gift of your Son. O world may celebrate the holiday, but we celebrate our King. And so help us this day, I pray, to humbly bow, to quietly gaze, to reflect deeply on your love for us. And so here this day, I pray, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart and our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my God, and my Redeemer, my Savior, and my King. Amen. It is said that Christmas is a time for giving. There's something unique about the spirit of Christmas, because it creates in all of us a spirit of giving, a desire within us to give the very best, to the ones that we love the most. Even the greatest Scrooge 
can be moved to give to those in need on Christmas. Even the greatest of the bah humbugs can be motivated to give on Christmas Day. And this is especially true of those who have the Spirit of Christ within them. And we of all people should know what it means to give and to have a spirit of giving. When our children were young, we bought them a Thomas play table so that they could play with the trains. Oh, they just loved Thomas. And so they could play with the trains and we could keep the trains off the floor. Now they wanted it for the longest time. And every time we would visit the store with one, well, they would get around that table and they would play and they would play and they would play. And then if we tried to leave the store, forget it. Because they would just play and they would play and they would play. So that year we got them one. And we set it up the night before, trains and all. There I was setting them up on the display. And then that moment came. When they walked into the room that morning, I couldn't wait. I was there with the video camera trying to capture that moment. And they walked down into the family room with eyes wide open. And then they raced towards that table with the excitement only a child could have, could almost imagine. And the only greater excitement found in that room was mine. Because I was just excited for them. And I couldn't contain myself. I thought, yes! What a joy! What laughter! What a riot! Why? Because we love to give to those that we love. And we of all people should know what it means to give. And to give to those that we love the most. And the reason we should know this is because we know the greatest giver of them all. And we know the one who gave of himself. And we know the reason why he gave. So when it comes to selfless giving, when it comes to sacrificial giving, we know the one who's the supreme example of what it means to give. Now turn with me here this evening to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. You can find that in your pew Bibles. If you cannot find your pew Bibles, we'll have it on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. In the Gospel of Matthew, we find the story of Christ's birth, the story of Joseph, the story of Mary. And we see the story of the wise men and their journey to find the king. In the Gospel of Luke, we find that story expanded. We see the angels and the angelic announcement, and we see the angels' visit to Mary, and the angels' visit to the shepherds. We see the amazing birth of John the Baptist, then the miraculous birth of Christ. We see of the shepherds being told of a Savior and, and their journey to find the Messiah. We hear of the angel's pronouncement, and in the heavenly chorus that followed. In the Gospel of John, we find one of the greatest discourses in the pages of Scripture. In 14 verses, John describes the wonder, the sheer wonder of the incarnation, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and full of truth. And we beheld his glory. Each writer in their own unique way describes for us the wonderful, wonderful story of what we call Christmas. But here in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul declares the Christmas story in one verse. 
In one short verse, the apostle moves us from Christmas to communion and then back again. And in one short verse, Paul describes the way Christ came and he describes why he came. And he does so in the context of giving and of giving sacrificially, of giving selflessly. And whenever Paul calls the body to a moral ethic, which is what he's doing in chapter 8, he points to the divine example. And to motivate the body at Corinth in terms of giving in the local church, he points to the supreme example of giving, and that is of Christ himself. So that when they realize their calling in Christ and how that came to be, they would recognize their imperative call to respond in the same fashion and to do the very same thing. And so Paul begins by saying, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that expression is true of the vast majority, I would pray all of us here this evening. But it is true that we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gnosko is used of a deep knowledge, of a settled conviction, of that of which we are very, very certain. And the words used of an intimate knowledge and to have the full knowledge of something. In other words, you shouldn't need to be reminded. You know this story full well. But in case you do need to be refreshed in your thinking, let me remind you. You know with certainty, with a deep and settled conviction, what Christ has done. You know, gnosko, the depths of knowledge, His grace in your life. Well, that's why it's always so great to share our testimonies, to share our story. It reminds us afresh of what Christ has done for us. And in so doing, it rekindles our passion, rekindles our faith rekindles our love for our Savior. And that's what Paul's trying to do here. To rekindle the fire of the Corinthians' faith that had grown dull. And he does so by reminding them of Christ's mission. And he does so by reminding them once again of Christ's incredible ministry. He says that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor, so that through his poverty, well, you might become rich. Paul uses an amazing play on words in this short verse to capture our attention. He moves from riches to poverty, from poverty to riches, all to prove a very particular and certain point. And he uses those two words throughout the verse, and he interchanges them to demonstrate that truth. First of all, he tells us Christ was rich. Now, not in the sense that we would think, because our thinking is far too limited. Whatever we think in terms of wealth, we're not even close to the riches that Christ had. And we think of a a few million dollars would do us well. Or maybe we could retire on our investments. But how do you fathom the wealth of the one who created all things? How do you fathom and begin to grasp the amount of wealth, riches, resources of the one who created everything that exists? Pluteo means to be rich, to be wealthy, to have an abundance of eternal possessions. Amen. Well, what kind of riches did Christ have in heaven? Well, perfect oneness with the Father. Perfect peace in all things. Perfect rest. Perfect harmony. Perfect unity, 
perfect worship of him and for him. Perfect power. Perfect knowledge. Perfect everything. In the environment that we long for, no pain, no suffering, no sorrow. Perfect everything. And Christ is the creator of all things. Is the owner of all things. And Lord of all. Everything we long for within our souls. What we could dream of. What we long for a glimpse of. As it relates to the things of heaven. As it relates to the things of eternity. Lord, come quickly. Please come quickly. Because we just long for a taste of that. All of that and more. Because we can't fathom, incapable of, the riches of his heavenly abode. The angelic realm bowing before him, worshiping him, adoring him, proclaiming him. And he left all of that to become poor. Not just poverty of possessions, not just poverty of position, poverty of personhood. Tokas means to cower, to crouch low, to be beggar poor, to be destitute. The God who had all of that to become beggar, beggar poor for the likes of us. To be so poor that one had no earthly resources, no earthly reputation. No earthly recognition. It's used of the beggar on the streets that has no hope but to gaze towards heaven. And it's used of extreme poverty. The likes of which most of us would never know or experience in this lifetime. It is the lowest of the lows. We you say, well, how low did Christ go as he plunged into the very depths of poverty? Well, it's certainly worth taking a look at. First of all, he was poor in his birth. We know that. Born into humanity as an infant. Born in a stable. Oh, not like we glorify it. Born into a hole carved in the cavern of a rock. Dark and dreary and damp and cold. Why? Because Scripture tells us in the midst of the worldly celebrations and all of the fanfare of their faith, too busy to see, too busy to recognize, too busy to slow down, there was no room for him in the inn. Nowhere else to go. The God who created all things. Nowhere else to go. So they crawled into a hole on the side of a cliff. And that's where our Lord, the King of all glory, was born. Secondly, he was poor in terms of his family. And we know that because Mary and Joseph, they had to offer two doves. Why? Because they didn't have any wealth. Rubbing two nickels together and praying for quarters. Nothing to give but a few birds. But in so doing, they gave their very hearts. His father Joseph, a carpenter. Our Lord Jesus grew up in that family, grew up in that home. Not all sorts of resources. No indication in the scriptures that they had any riches at all quite poor. 
thirdly, he's poor throughout his ministry. Luke tells us he had no home. Scripture tells us foxes have holes and birds have nests. Son of man has no place to lay his head. He had no farms, no pastures, no palaces, no property of his own. He could have created bread for himself, though he was tempted to do it. He could have created a home for himself. He probably could have commanded chariots for himself. And yet he relied on others to provide for him. Fourthly, he was poor in his death. Born into a, a cavern carved in the hole of a cliff into a cave. He died in a very similar dwelling place. He had no wealth to leave for others, no possessions to hand away. When he died, he only had the clothes on his back. And even those, they stripped from him on the cross. And then as if it couldn't get any lower. Oh, he didn't have a grave site that the family owned and had purchased years before. Buried in a borrowed tomb. That's how poor our Lord and Savior was. And then all that he had, Scripture tells us, was divided amongst the soldiers who had crucified him. Our Lord Jesus Christ died with absolutely nothing except the totality of our sins hurled against him. Well, fifthly, he struck the deepest of poverty when he was separated from his Father in heaven. How poor can poor be? For our Lord, that was the lowest of lows because nothing could hurt him more than that moment in time when the Father turned away from his Son as our sins blanketed him on the cross. All had betrayed him. All had run away. All had taken everything and anything that they could from the king of kings. And even in the lowest of lowest moments, it got even worse. And his father, whom, whom he'd known for all of eternity, turned his face away from his son. And Jesus had no one to cry out to. No one to call out to who would hear. We at least have that. And our Lord did not. Paul describes the depths of Christ's poverty and humility in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. He calls us to have the same attitude in ourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, a thing to cling to, to clutch to, to hold on to for dear life like we all would. Oh, we don't want to die with our possessions, do we? Man, if we could load them up and put them in the U-Haul and take them to the grave site, we would. But we can't. But he didn't cling to it. He didn't clutch to it. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being made in the likeness of us. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. He left the greatest place to come to the lowest place on earth. And in his poverty, he took on humanity, 
with all of its limitations, with all of its burdens, with all of its pain, with all of its grief and its sorrows, because he was acquainted with our grief and our sorrows. In his poverty, he faced death. Not just any death. The worst death known to mankind. And nailed to that cross in the midst of the physical pain was our sins. And the weight of that guilt and the pain must have been overwhelming. The sinless one covered it. Covered and blanketed with the sins of humanity. Though he was rich, so easy to say, he became poor. But here comes the good news. Here comes the reason why he became poor. In order that through his poverty, in order through not one level, two level, three level, four level, five, and low down into the depths of the ground, That through his poverty, we might become rich. That Christ gave up heaven. Why? So that we could be heaven bound. Christ gave up eternal riches. So that we could have an abundance of eternal wealth. Repeatedly in the epistles. And Paul reminds us of the great inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus. That all that he left, that perfect abode, that perfect place, is what we inherit as children of God. While he was rich, he became poor. So that through his poverty, we, who do not deserve it, would inherit all All that is true of the living God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In Christ, men and women, we lack nothing. He's given us great abundance in this life. It's a taste of what we will receive when we join him and see him face to face. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and to godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promise so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world by lust. Think of all that Christ has given to us. Of all that Christ has provided for us. Of all that the Apostle Paul would describe as saying he lavished upon us. His love, his care, his protection, his guidance, his spirit. His very life. Christ in you, the hope of all glory. His prayers, His nurture, His word, His grace, His mercy, His peace, His presence, His comfort, His strength, His healing, His forgiveness. We could go on and on and on and on. And through eternity, we will. 
Paul takes great pains to emphasize why Christ did all this. And we don't see it right away. And sometimes in our translations, we don't see it at all because we try to smooth out the translation so that it reads well. But it's in there. And it's screaming for our attention. It's screaming for some sense of application. Paul uses a figure of speech called chiasm, simply meaning to crisscross. And think of the letter X. And Paul uses the terms poor and rich, and he crosses them in the verse itself. He was rich, but he became poor. In poor, we become rich. It's the Holy Spirit working through the life of Paul. The penmanship being the Spirit of God. It's an amazing short passage. And typically, at the center of the structure, which is what we do not see in our English translations, is the key element or the point of the very passage. It's a simple phrase, but it's a profound one. Dia humas. For the sake of you. Rich, poor, poor, Rich for the sake of the likes of us. At the heart of the passage, we see the heart of Christ. He did this, all of this, for us. So here's the point of the verse. If Christ gave like this, well, we ought to give in the same fashion. Now, to the church at Corinth, Paul was speaking in terms of finances. I'm not here to discuss the finances this evening. I'm not here to ask that we give monetarily, but if the Lord leads you to do that, certainly we'd be blessed. But my focus here is that we give spiritually. Christ became poor so that through his poverty, we might gain the things of heaven. But Christ also tells us that to gain the things of heaven, we must become poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Same Greek word, tokas. To be beggar poor. And it seems that if we're going to grasp the heavenly things, then we need to give something up. We need to let go of some things. We need to give some things up for him and to him. And so this Christmas Eve, I want us all to lay one gift. That's the gift that you have in your hands. That small, seemingly insignificant little box that I'm told is made out of foam. But wrapped in colorful paper with a bow. It'll probably be the smallest ornament, the smallest gift beneath the tree or ornament hanging on your tree. Might even cause some people to say, what's that? It doesn't appear like much. It doesn't seem like much. It's so small. Isn't that the way Christ came? But that little gift that you've been given It's been given for a reason. And somehow through this service, through the night, the Spirit of God will speak to each and every one of us. This is an opportunity 
to lay something before the throne of God, to bring something to our Lord and our Savior. That small little box that you have in your hands. Oh, you pray over it. You dwell upon it. And you let the Spirit of God speak to your soul. What gift would you give to the Lord Jesus Christ this Christmas Eve or in Christmas morn to follow? Oh, you take that time, you reflect deeply. And you hold on to that little gift. It wasn't meant for you. It's meant for Him. I want us to lay that gift before His feet. And maybe it's the one thing that you've held on to tightly. It's the one thing that you just will not let go. Now's the time for the gift. Maybe it's a possession. Maybe it's a position. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's an idol. Well, maybe it's not a negative habit or sin at all. Maybe it's something really positive. Maybe we give him some more of our time. Maybe just maybe you make a determined effort and you give him this gift and you say, I'm going to give you much more of my attention. A far greater sense of deeper devotion. Maybe we give him more of our worship. We give him more of our talents. Maybe more of our treasures. Maybe we give him more of our heart, more of our soul, more of our minds, more of our being. Maybe this very day, this very moment, you give him your heart and you give him your life. And you ask him in to be your Lord and your Savior. Savior, because today, this day, this hour, this moment, God is speaking to you. And this day is the day of salvation. And this day, that little gift is everything that is you. And that's what you're going to give to the Lord this Christmas. He's given the greatest gift for you. This is going to be your greatest gift to Him. Your heart, your soul, your life, and faith. Whatever it is, and you know what it is, I'm asking that we all become poor this Christmas. And bring it before Him. And give it to him as his Christmas present. And we're going to sing Silent Night in a moment to conclude the service. You should all have candles, and Andy's going to lead the charge in the lighting of them. And music will play quietly, so if the worship team wants to come forward, music will play quietly as we light the candles. But then we are going to sing Silent Night together. And as you ponder the moment, as you ponder the wonder of Christ, think about what you want to give to the King of Kings. Think of what you'd give to Him if you were the wise men traveling that journey and you saw the Messiah. They gave the best of the best. Think about it overnight and in the morning. I'm asking that we lay our gifts at His feet. And what might seem so small and lost in all of the other ribbons and ornaments that so many will gloss over and glance by, our Lord Jesus Christ will see right through it all and right to that little box And he'll treasure it in his heart. 
I concluded last week with this quote. Majesty in the midst of the mundane. Holiness in the filth of sheep manure and sweat. Divinity entering the world on the floor of a stable. Through the womb of a teenager and in the presence of a carpenter. Humble, humble royalty. A God with tears. A creator with a heart. God became earth's mockery to save his children. How absurd to think that such nobility would go to such poverty to share such a treasure with such thankless souls. But he did. In fact, the only thing more absurd than the gift is our unwillingness to receive it. I am praying this Christmas Eve and the Christmas morn to come. We'll bring God glory. We'll bring Him praise. We'll bring Him adoration. But we will bring Him the best Christmas presents we could ever ever give. Let's pray. Father, we come to adore you. We come to praise you. As we conclude the evening, Father, I'm praying your spirit move and move in such a way as you speak to us We are in the place to hear. In the midst of all the busyness, help us to get away and to be still and to know that you are God. And as you speak to us, Father, I pray, may this be a moment of transformation in our lives. May it be a moment of renewal, revival, restoration. May it be a moment of salvation for those here that don't know you. So Father, I pray for us all and ask that we would simply spend this weekend oh yes, loving our family and our friends but gazing at you, I pray. And when people ask us what that glow is in our face, what's that delight within our soul, what's that joy deep within our hearts, when they ask us, may we be quick to respond that it is always and will always forever be for you and because of And so we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
And by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. It is our prayer here at EFRI that we all have a blessed and merry Christmas. May the Lord be with us all. Travel safe, rejoice well, love your family, love your friends. And until we see each other again next week to celebrate communion, what a way to bring it all home. We'll gather together and we'll worship before his table in this coming Sunday. Have a great day great weekend and a great week in the Lord. You are dismissed. As you would blow out the candles, certainly there'll be a place for you to place them as you would exit. Um, but thank you for being here this evening. Amen. <laughs>